I don't know if I'm prepared to cry today. Oh no, 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 no. No. Not now. Uh, uh, I'm dreading what's gonna happen. It adds a lot knowing how much how much responsibility he feels for her. Why? Damn, this is dramatic. Literally fighting their their way out. They just keep coming. Oh my god, her arm is that her? oh my god. It means so much more the second time. Oh man, the the images in the scene are unreal. Be free. She's, yeah, she wasn't leaving on her own. There's no way. He got her out with his last, probably last action. Almost definitely last action. Wow. Who was that? Who was that face? I, I feel like we may have seen him before, but I can't quite remember. If we haven't seen him before, it means we definitely will again. The more I watch, the more Violet's not experiencing the the emotion of this directly makes sense. At first, I think I attributed it to just her personality being somewhat robotic, not having a lot of experience, not having lived a normal life, and that's definitely part of it. But specific to this incident, it seems apparent that she did feel it very fully, but it just was too much to really confront head on. So it just kind of got buried. I mean, there's this weird kind of subconscious calculus that happens where the pain of loss in front of you is just too great to comprehend. And so the way it gets experienced is just something like panic and desperation. But it was all there. And, you know, speaking of people being mirrors and dolls sort of being reflections of, of humans, the show's done a great job at showing how her experiences with other people have sh kind of shown her herself and kind of unlocked this compartment that, you know, she's been sealing away for her own sanity. But I think for me in particular, the most impactful part of that scene is not Violet, although it's certainly impactful, but the major. There's this duality of painful hopelessness with something that's actually quite beautiful. I mean, he's saying all these things. He's saying that he, he loves her and, you know, he's trying to keep her safe or get her out of there, knowing full well that this is it. You know, this is the end. Probably also knowing that Violet won't really understand it at this point, can't really get it. You know those moments where you, you feel like only you see the situation clearly? You just have so much emotion bottled up and you just see things so clearly in their beauty but there's no way, there's no direct way to get it across. There's no way to just, you know, give it to someone and have a sort of duality of experience in that way in that particular moment. And so all you can do is just for yourself, I guess, for its own sake, just for the beauty of the moment, put it out there and look at it yourself and it's beautiful, but also terribly lonely. And that seems to be how he went out. His final act was saving her yet again, looking out for her yet again. Right. This flower is giving me Valkyria Chronicles vibes. Yeah, I understand why they did it, and it was well-meaning, but I don't know. I feel like that's that's not the right call. I mean, I guess for her own safety. Is it raining, or are we tear bending? Where do you want to go? The w major's last request was interesting. It was for her to be free. Oh, Oh, how can you do the, this kind of work now? Isn't that infuriating? Isn't it infuriating that he's still looking out for her even in his death and there's nothing that she can do? He's the only, only one at that point. But not anymore. He was sort of the bridge for her between worlds. I don't know, I feel like the best you can hope for in these situations is to be okay while not being okay, if that makes sense. That's really true. But I won't feel like that right now for Violet. It's really gut-wrenching. I think a big part of that kind of love, and this is not just true of romantic love. I mean, I mean, I think any kind of deep relationship, there's this process that happens that's like soul DNA bonding, where being that connected to someone means that you, you start to envision your life with them in it, you know, to a point where it's 
maybe even inte- integral or more integral than you, you first realize. A romantic partner, let's say, you know, activities, future, your hopes, how you want to be perceived by the other person. That's like internal code being written. And so in a very real way, the person becomes part of who you are. There's this concept that people are always with you even when you lose them. And I think that I often thought about that in terms of, you know, memory and things you've learned from that person. But I think it's a lot more than that as well. It's like your very being has incorporated them. Who you are is built on what you had with them and who they are to you in no small way even. And you know, the good news is that meaning and identity are something that always exists in a certain state. You know, we always have to have something, we always have to have some kind of identity or just natural infrastructure of being, but it's flexible and can be updated. And that doesn't mean losing the person. It just means accepting reality and doing sort of a, a rewrite, which means there are certain parts of you that are gonna die, you know, like the future dreams, for example, with that person. And in these situations, it's sort of like, how are you expected to see the value in anything or make any sort of plan when your entire outlook is now missing a, a critical component. And so I don't know any other way through that than striving to accept the truth and having faith that it's not the end and it's not the final assessment of what meaning is and what's possible for you. And then also to be ultra kind on yourself in the process, just because when things feel like they're hopeless, they really feel hopeless. It's not really something that you can will yourself through easily. It, it just sort of takes time and reflection and allowing the, the things that are still beautiful and still good to grow more permanent roots in the holes that have been filled by the loss. Anti-peace faction. They need to work on their branding. Why would you be outwardly anti-peace of all things? The world still feels like it's on the brink of war. Wait, who, I, didn't, I missed that. Who was that? Looked like her. Is that her leaving a part of herself behind? This is probably the best thing for her, but I feel like to her it's going to feel impossible. What's the point? How can you be a blank vessel for others when you've got that much going on? Man, I was going to say it's bad that she has all these memories of him. I mean, specifically the bear. But even worse, it's her literal hands. Yeah. Those kinds of burns can hide for a long time. He wasn't wrong. For all his hiding the truth from Violet, I mean, I feel like that's it's sort of dead on. But it has to be when she's ready. If she doesn't do that, it's going to continue to burn her up. And she's also gained a lot, but again, it won't feel that way now. This incident with Violet is rippling through the entire cast. Do you know now? This is tricky. I feel like it comes down to the person. If I'm going through something, I want people around me as much as possible. Even though the joy of being with people that I care about in these moments is dulled by the pain and by, you know, a singular focus on what was lost, I know from experience and from hindsight that it's what I need. I feel like the alternative is just so much worse. I think part of the process of healing is what I said about kind of restructuring that lost reality. If all your hope was put on one thing or one person or whatever the case may be, and that thing is now gone, it's gonna feel hopeless and it's gonna feel impossible. And it will feel that way until until there's other things that you can feel hopeful about. And so the more just great things you put in your life, even if you don't feel it at first, that I think is going to be conducive to healing. That being said, at the heart of it all are things that only the individual can do. And there's no easy way through it. It's just like burning, basically. And more importantly, is she going to be okay? But they're all concerned. Is this a dream? Yeah. This is one of those awful good dreams. Or maybe just an awful, awful dream. Oh no! It's horrific. Yeah, that's the worst feeling. I'll bet even in that, that horrific dream, there's still some relief in it. Waking up is going to be a nightmare in itself. Oh. Damn, I felt that. Yeah, you want to turn to anger and rage, but you can't. You know it won't help. It's so sad. It's so sad. It's terrible to say even that I can relate to this feeling.
I feel like order there really means just something to believe in, something to focus on, some kind of salvation. This is God answering her prayers. This guy is just secretly like emotional Santa Claus. He's just always there at the right moment. Give this man a raise and a promotion. It's the best thing for her. Yeah, this is hard, but it's better than just living in that hole. In a lot of my worst states, when I just have nothing to do and no one to meet, I feel like even just going for a walk and just getting out and seeing people, seeing traffic, it's its not nothing. It helps me like reconnect to something bigger than myself. Sometimes I feel like those walks are like... Literally feels like they're for salvation, you know, it's like just gotta get out and do something. It's just like anything else, you know, anything else than whatever desperate state I'm in that just has its own self-generating momentum downwards. Just moving, you know, it's it's nothing. It's insignificant in the face of whatever's going on, but it's like being at one out of a hundred, you know, it's better than being at zero. It's just the first steps back into life. One of my favorite scenes in any movie ever is uh, in the movie 500 Days of Summer, where there's a montage. It's like a pain or post pain montage where the guy just can't do anything, can't get out of bed, but he just starts bouncing a, a ball on the wall and that creates a rhythm and then that slowly builds into something else. And you see he's able to return to something like normal life, arguably better than he was before, you know, sort of more honest with himself. And I always thought they got that exactly right. You know, it's like, you're just paralyzed at first. You can't do anything. And the first steps are, are often the hardest, but the good news is that you don't have to do much, you know, it's just, you have to do something. As difficult as it is, you just have to do something that's good, anything. And then again, just faith, and you just trust that it has its own momentum. And you know, you put that plus time on your side. Uh, you know, I believe there's nothing you can't overcome. This guy knows, she did some good. It was sweet that they, they did this for her, that they wrote her this letter. Not even knowing the contents. These are pros at work, too. It's not just any letter. Man, that would mean the world to me. Oh, that's who he is, I remember now. That's great. And great timing, while well, I can see sort of the impact of her work. And also just people can have a, a new chance. First start. <laughs> it's funny that she, she's been doing this this whole time and never really had that deep emotional connection to it at that level, but it makes sense. Is that her namesake? There you go, there's an order. Shachonoshalutori,私はたくさんのやけどをしていました。いいのでしょうか?自動式人形でいていいのでしょうか?生きていていいのでしょうか?Yeah, I think that's the real question. That's really what she was getting at. Do I still have a chance despite what I've been through and what I've done? The answer is, of course, yes. Is that my favorite controversial couple? <laughs><笑>君が自動式人形としてやってきたことも消えないんだよ。バイオレットエヴァーガーデン。That oh, was a tough one. It's very sad, but also hopeful, and I feel correct in its message and in its aim. I love that idea of becoming someone worthy of your name. I feel like it's always a possibility, and it's not a scale, you know, or like cumulative points that add up to determine what you are and whether or not you're a good person or a bad person. It's just the moment that you have and what you do with it. And I don't think it's ever too late for that. And I, I don't believe, or maybe I just don't want to believe that there's ever a point where the next moment becomes impossible or doing good things becomes impossible. I really like the images of flowers in this episode. You know, at the start of it, there was just this one solitary stalk that was kind of emerging from the battlefield. And then, you know, at the end we have this huge array of flowers and these bouquets sort of symbolizing Violet's growth and return. Something better than she ever was, probably. Despite all the pain, despite all the loss she's experienced, despite all the, the guilt she has about the terrible things she's done. And from where I'm sitting, even though at points in this episode, it likely felt like her world had ended. To me, it seems like it's the beginning for her. And this episode also really captures something that I felt very acutely, you know, like, well, a bunch of things. 
to be honest. I know the pain of loss and I know the feeling that things will never be okay again, wanting to just disappear. And I also know how difficult it can be to, to do stuff in that state, you know? Like, generally I'd say that over time I've gotten to a place where, as I said, you know, I'm okay even when I'm not okay. But, you know, I'm human, so like everyone, I have some really dark moments. And I've found those moments to be especially difficult over the past uh, year or so, just because of my circumstance. You know, I sort of moved to a new place without any friends or family. And I did that for a romantic relationship. And so when things go wrong and when things don't work out or there are moments where it feels like it's over, it really feels like it's over because there's nowhere to even turn. And I can say it's it's sometimes really difficult to make videos. You know, it's really difficult to focus on other characters and other characters' emotions and to sort of try to be a, a blank slate and to be receptive of things that are coming out of shows, to try to find the beauty in things when everything just doesn't look great. But generally speaking, I kind of force myself to do it and I never regret it. In fact, I think similar to Violet, it helps me sort of reconnect to things that are important and to not just see things as being about me and limited to myself and rather seeing a broader picture, having faith and having hope and also having things reflected back at me that I've been too afraid to look at. And then also, like I was saying, just the mere act of doing something, you know, just knowing that, wow, I actually did it. You know, I made it through the day. <laughs> I did something that was hopefully net positive. Just the act of moving, just the act of continuing and, you know, doing what I had planned to do is kind of undeniable proof that things are fine. You know, that as dark as they seem, things are fine. And that this, the answer is just faith and, you know, putting one foot in front of the other. <laughs> so it's, it's really tough stuff to watch Violet cope with this. The depth of her loss is pretty pretty deep, pretty traumatic, very tragic, and just ultra visceral. But it's easy to root for her, and I feel like the feelings of hope make it kind of worth the pain. Honestly, this could have been the last episode, and it would have been a complete show. So I'm really curious to see what it is from here. I don't think we're completely done with the growth and with the tears, and I'm excited to see where Violet Evergarden goes from here. <laughs>